Right. So we are, we are, we are all kicked off and 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 and, and ready. I think maybe uh, something. Uh, a bit of a weird setup. Uh, my monitor's over here. My camera's over here. And my anyway, we'll we'll work it out as we we, we go along. Because um, uh, why are you not working? Oh, this one. There. Everything. Uh, <laughs> cool. Um, um, right now my brain is just like full of stuff. And when I say stuff, I mean stuff. This big old jumble mess of things that I somehow need to get into a consistent stream of intelligible information that we can all follow, sort of. And I have to do it online with 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 uh, chat uh, and, and QA uh, Q and A even. Uh, both of which are distracting because oh, we just can feedback on the talk, and uh, the talk is kind of designed to be on on Rails, at least for the first part, uh, because that's how talks used to work. Um, so given all of this, I may ignore this uh, at least for the for the, for the first part. Um, Otherwise, this this is not happening. It's not you. It's it's me. Welcome to my brain. Let me just quickly um, tell them it's sorted. So, uh, hi, um, I'm Dom Davis, uh, and I, I have depression. Um, Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Uh, although with uh, eighty something minutes left on the clock, I should probably elaborate more. Um, a former colleague of mine suggested that the title gave away the talk punchline, except this isn't that talk. That talk started off about, uh, talking about people uh, and then took a hard left into crazy. And then it dropped a strategic nuclear warhead on the uh, uh, crowd. Uh, there it is. Kevin Henney tweeted this, yes, I framed it. No, I am not sorry. That talk wasn't filmed. Uh, in fact, the entire track uh, wasn't filmed because we wanted honesty. Uh, people tend to hold back if there's the threat of it being on the internet for all to see for, for all eternity. Um, this talk is already on the internet, so it's designed to be slightly less of a baseball bat around the face. Nonetheless, we are talking about depression and my experiences of depression, so there's going to be mentions on certain topics, so trigger warning, uh, references to suicidal thoughts, suicide, and uh, self-harm. That said, we're going to try and keep this upbeat because I want to leave with positive outcomes. And honestly, it just makes it easier to talk about. Um, while we've been asked to keep this PG-13, we're also going to be covering some pretty mature themes, and there will likely be some robust language use, so viewer discretion is advised. Before we start, I'll quickly introduce you to a quick rule of thumb with me. If mouth is flapping, all is fine. And yes, I am a go dev. Russell liked to sprinkle non C developers around ACCU to spice things up just a little. Uh, given there are more conditions, however, let's, let's make this a little bit more idiomatic. Okay, mouth flapping, all fine, good. Uh, if I close off, but I respond to electronic communications, I'm struggling, but I'm okay. Don't need to worry. And um, if I do disappear, I do actually have a network of people who will check in on me and uh, make sure that all is good. Um, I say this because sometimes I, I tell people about how my brain works, and people legitimately ask, should we be worried? No, mouth is flapping. All is good. Um, oh, and if you've not seen my talks before, it's all tangents. It's a function of my brain, and it's a good way to get a fantastically complex subject broken down into something that we can cover in the time given. So with that in mind, um, AI. Uh, I'm based in rural Norfolk, uh, so I should quantify that I am talking about artificial intelligence and not artificial insemination. I have argued in the past that uh, the definition of AI really depends on your definitions of artificial and your definitions of, of intelligence. Uh, note how our thesaurus provides fake and false as synonyms for artificial. This amuses me. My preferred definition is, is a moving away front of things a human can do, but a computer can't. This does mean that we are never actually going to get AI, because the moment it can be done by a computer, it's no longer AI, but then that's really been the case for, for, for a while now. Um, of course, at the moment, I'm talking about ANI, or Artificial Narrow Intelligence, programs that can do one thing at human levels or better, but that can't do all the things. We're surrounded by this type of AI. We don't even notice it, at least not until I go, Alexa, play Baby Shark by Ping Pong on repeat. And yes, every single device in my house is currently on mute. 
the ultimate goal appears to be AGI, or artificial general intelligence. That is AI that has human level intelligence, which for me is very abstract. This is Margaret Hamilton, a particularly smart human. Her work, along with the work of thousands of other smart and brave humans, resulted in a phrase that brings shivers to me even now. You may see the hairs go off my arm. Houston, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. And there are other humans who will argue that it's all faked on a Hollywood soundstage. These people are currently in space, circling around our planet every 90 minutes, a planet that some claim is flat. My problem with AGI is that, in general, humans can be quite dumb. Uh, I only have to look at myself uh, and the cacophony of, of dumb things I do on a daily basis. To err uh, is human. There's also this argument that once we get to AGI, we'll quickly see artificial superintelligence, or, or ASI. Uh, the AGI will rewrite itself uh, at an exponential rate, uh, and humanity is destroyed as the planet is turned into paperclips or something like that. I, I may have any skin read the material. Um, but how is this AI uh, rewriting itself? If it's a genetic algorithm, algorithm then it's fitness function uh, for what iteration is best. And what is the fitness function here? What goal has it been optimized for? What hardware is this going to be running on? Because I imagine it's going to need some more compute. And finally, while it's entirely possible that it could evolve to ignore SIGINT, we always have SIG term. And failing that, I'd love to see software defeat a suitably motivated human with a fire axe. Meanwhile, Boston Dynamics seem intent on ruining the advantages we had. Gone are the days when come the robot uprising, we just run upstairs and shut the door. Still, provided we don't arm these things, I'd wager a fire axe will still serve as well. Now, even if you take nothing else away from this talk, please, please, please never let AI reproduce and never, ever arm them without a human in the loop. I mean, ideally, we shouldn't be arming them at all, but that's a different talk. Now, there's a bunch of different approaches to AI, uh, depending on what you're, you're doing um, and what you're trying to achieve and what you class as AI. Um, but I want to throw a special shout out to, to neural nets. Uh, the argument is that you model uh, the human brain to mimic the human brain, which is great, except for four potential problems. Number one, uh, the human brain is many many orders of magnitude more complex than neural nets. Uh, the number of neurons and connections dwarfs even the largest man-made approximations. Number two, even if we could match the complexity, we're not modeling the full electrochemical function of the brain. It's not just neurons passing signals to one another. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on that I won't even pretend to understand. Number three, while the brain can perform many automatic functions from birth, it takes years to train. And number four, the human brain is as buggy as hell. It turns out that while evolution is great at adapting, it's shockingly bad at refactoring and throwing away old stuff. Pretty much everything is, is, is a clutch, built on a hack and built on something that, that barely works. Don't believe me? Which circle is bigger? Trick question, they're both the same size. Uh, seeing, it turns out, is, is not believing uh, because the human vision system is a basically duct tape uh, duct together system that, that works on clutches. Uh, the fact that it works at all is, is a miracle. Um, let's just see if I can reconnect that. Yes, I can. Um, now, I'm not one for advocating complete rewrites of complex systems because there's the worry you'll throw the baby out with the bathwater. Most of the complexity has likely arisen because of edge cases you haven't considered yet. But the human brain, bin it. Start again from first principles, although that's only gonna work for AI, uh, not humans who are somewhat stuck with this simultaneously amazing and uh, downright awful uh, bit of wetware. It amuses me that bugs in this web where have resulted in me being described as an AI expert. I am not, and that's not just me being uh, modest. I am categorically not uh, an AI expert. I know enough to, to be dangerous. Uh, what I can do, however, is help non-technical people understand what we actually mean when we say AI, because it turns out that the communication protocol utilized by humans is also buggy and error-prone. 
while we're listing the things that I'm not an expert on, I should probably also state that I am not uh, uh, an expert on uh, neurodiversity, uh, clinical depression, uh, human psychology, uh, or pretty much any other topic I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm also working on a sample size of, of one. So let's pick another thing I'm not an expert on and dive headfirst into this, Heber Heber, a book I was given in the 1970s, which helps to explain that in a typical Dr. Zeus type of way, um, that with the possible exception of being a mother or a father, it doesn't matter if you're a Heber or a Sheber and you can do whatever you want to do. I have no doubt that for the 1970s, this was particularly forward thinking, pushing radical ideas of gender equality. These days, it seems somewhat dated, lacking uh, a they bear, or better still, not even bothering to mention gender at all in the first place, uh, and teaching that if you're a bear, you can do whatever you want to do. In the 70s, we knew that there were men and that there were women, and we were waking up to the idea that perhaps women, and to a lesser extent men, should be able to do whatever job they wanted. Four decades on, and we know it's way more complex than that, even at the biological level. I bring this up because that buggy wetware we call a brain is having to run on all kinds of different hardware configurations with all kinds of interactions happening all the time. People who outwardly may look similar and yet are demonstrably different in terms of what's going on inside. Also, we're not bears. So takeaway number one. You have absolutely no idea what someone is going through, even if that person could be considered neurotypical, whatever that means. It is my conjecture that regardless of your definition of normal for the human brain, it is still held together with bits of string, and it is still prone to going spectacularly wrong for utterly bizarre reasons. Now, as a social species, we have developed a number of ways to indicate and communicate our current state. And some of us are good at reading these cues, but we can misread them, sometimes badly. It also doesn't help that the people generally try and hide their true state, presenting something they believe to be more socially acceptable. For example, behind this calm and smiling exterior is the full-blown panic attack that comes hand in hand with me for live speaking. Uh, I deal with this basically by going into tunnel vision, uh, blocking out the entire world except for the talk. This is not helpful when it's online and necessity has decoupled my slides from my script and, and, and I'm having to keep an eye out for, for chat and, 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 and Q&A. I've no real idea of my audience size or, or state. Are they engaged? Am I boring them? Are they laughing at the right bits? Can they even hear me? Or does the magic of the internet mean I'm a robotic sounding jumble of pixels? Regardless of neurotype, I suspect all the speakers are dealing with the same feelings. In his keynote yesterday, Kevin, the person who tweeted about uh, this with my other talks, uh, mentioned context, quite a lot actually, which is good because I'm going to talk a lot about contexts and how they basically make the state of any given human unknown, maybe even unknowable, even to the human who currently maintains that state. Let's look into a, a human interaction and the state changes. Um, so my manager comes to me in uh, my desk and he says, hey, Dom, uh, we need to have a chat. Is 4 p.m. good for you? I reply, yeah, sure. That's scenario number two. Uh, my manager comes to my, chat, uh, my desk and says, hey, Dom, we, we need to have a chat. Is, is 4 p.m. good for you? And I reply, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, spotted the difference. On the surface, these, these two scenarios look identical, but in scenario one, I bung a reminder into my calendar and then I forget about it until it reminds me at 3.55, at which point I go have the chat. In scenario two, however, my, yeah, sure, is masking the fact that my body has just dumped a metric crap ton of adrenaline into my bloodstream. My fight or flight response has been triggered and I am now hyper aware of everything, including everything I have done wrong recently. I now achieve nothing until 4 p.m. where, terrified, I go and face my fate. And when I say terrified, I mean terrified, full-blown anxiety attack, elevated heart rate, inability to concentrate, and my body is just chucking in loads and loads of chemicals, which are great when you're facing down a saber-toothed tiger, seriously unhelpful in a meeting room. Now, some of you will be nodding along here, well aware of that kind of sickening feeling, but I also suspect there'll be those of you who are lucky enough to be uh, in scenario one. It's hard to put into context. Ooh, look, there's that word. This might help some people understand the terror. 
or snakes, or being really high up or jumping out of a plane, that feeling before you go into an exam, the oh no second, when you realize you've just killed production. That is what those of us in scenario number two are feeling from the moment you mention the chat until the moment we hopefully realized it's not as terrible as we imagined. And the spider is now gone if you've looked away. And while you may laugh, I know people who have a visceral fear of spiders so deep that even a silhouette would have had them squirming. Don't laugh. Be thankful that your debilitating fear is not impinging on your life. And in, just in case it did cause you terror, I, I do unreservedly apologize, although I will point out I did warn you at the start, albeit somewhat obtusely. I might be lying about the mild fantasy pair, although it just amuses me when that warning pops up when the, uh, the kids are watching TV. So please, for the love of all that is good, give us a hint as to what the meeting is about. Those who are already in scenario one can arrive possibly more prepared. And those of us who would be in scenario two might be able to actually do something other than panic in the interim. Now, the problem here is context. You, as the manager, have all the context. We, as the employee, have to guess at that context. And we're really quite bad at guessing. Hence the prevalence of, of this kind of meme. Incidentally, const lives on the left. West const is the only option source the Go compiler. Moving on. So here's a human, which we're representing as a big old mess of jumbled contexts. And here is another human, which is a different big old mess of jumbled contexts. And we're going to assume that the set of contexts overlap, but crucially, for any given context C, the overlapping area is only broadly equivalent for humans A and B. They are not identical. What's worst is also possible for context chi to exist in human A and human B where chi A is not equal to chi B. For human A to broadly know the state of human B, the state of human B must be a subset of the state of human A. I posit this is never the case. The initial state of human B is not known to human A and vice versa. Human A can attempt to pass information to human B through a combination of natural body language, uh, sorry, natural language, body language, uh, and, and actions. So an example of natural language would be me asking you to, to shut the door. Uh, body language might be me looking annoyed and glancing pointedly at the door. Actions could be me getting up and closing the door, something which I could do casually or in a passive aggressive manner. Human A will have intent when they try to pass this information, and human B will have comprehension. In a perfect world, intent and comprehension will match, and a subset of contexts are brought in line. That is, given the state where concept A, uh, context A even is not equal to uh, context B, then the resultant state is now a broadly common context. Or where there is a new context, it ends up with the resultant state being broadly common. More likely, a poorly understood context is badly articulated and then misunderstood by the recipient. Uh, historically, this is the genesis of almost all uh, software. Here we can start with uh, and end with context A not equal to context B, uh, although context B is, is no longer null. Uh, start and end with context A not equal to context B, which is um, effectively the same as no information flow, and, uh, oops, too far. Um, back, back, annoying. <laughs> Bear with. There we go, yes. So even start and end with context A not equal to context B, and context B and context B prime also not being equal. Although if we allow context A to be null and not care if context B and context B prime are equal, then these are basically the same three scenarios. Um, they are not. The fourth scenario, which is my all-time favorite, we have gone from broadly understanding each other to not understanding each other at all. And the best bit is we may not even know that state changes occurred. In situations like this, I am human A, and there are N humans out there, each with their own ball of context, and each with their own unique comprehension. 
Some may be relying on, on just verbal cues. Uh, some may be using visual cues as well. I don't know. And this particular setup means there's a disconnect with feedback. I have no idea if what I'm saying is, is resonating or if I'm just yelling into the void. Uh, the chat window is not the same as having uh, an audience. Incidentally, the, the cone in the middle, pointing away from you or directly towards you. Can you make it flip up uh, and, and back and forth? I'll file another bug against the brain. So the initial idea for this talk was we would all be in a room, uh, and once I've done my bit to, to camera, uh, we could perhaps open things up. I'm still game for that. Uh, but I would suspect the fact this is on the internet and the fact that anyone can view it may cause people to not quite be as open uh, as they might in, in, in close discussion. Also, after a panic that I might not have enough material for the session without a lot of audience participation, I'm now worried that I'm not going to be able to fit everything in the lot of time. We'll wing it and we'll see how it goes. Oh, yes, and I did just put a pink unicorn in my slide. Uh, and no, I'm not sorry. Um, also, Rainbow from the My Little Pony movie is a blinding track with a cool video. Don't judge me until you've heard it. Anyway, I digress. Um, that talk that, that Kevin tweeted about in, in 2019 uh, was called uh, Tans Kaput Vos Eus Kaput, Kaput Macht. Now, I don't speak German, something that has just become painfully obvious to, to those of you who do. Uh, but I do listen to a lot of loud, shouty, uh, bleepy German music. Uh, this is the title of a track uh, from a collective called Straftanz, uh, a name that roughly translates to uh, punishment dance. Uh, and the track is something like Dance Destroy That Which Destroys You, with uh, thanks to Burkhard Klaus for uh, the uh, translation. In that talk, uh, a number of people who knew I had depression, or the, the number of people I knew, uh, who knew I had depression, I should say, uh, went from uh, just a handful to everyone in the room. And it was quite a big room. And the, the talk was surprisingly well attended. And I knew full well that what I was doing would be resulting in adjectives like brave, courageous. Uh, the dictionary definition on my laptop defines brave as ready to face danger and endure pain. Uh, courageous is not deterred by danger or pain. And if we look at the thesaurus entries, the, the mind just boggles. What the hell is manful? Um, now, given I might be about to face uh, and endure danger or pain, um, I'd rather like to go back to the beginning of, of the talk and do something a little less uh, daredevil. Um, so, hi, I'm Don Davis, and I have gout. Uh, you'll notice a, a, a slight change to the talk title, but it's still a medical condition, and it still holds true. Would it make the grade for an ACCU talk? Honestly, I, I don't know, but given you can submit multiple requests, it, it, it could be worth a try. Um, absolutely no one in the world would describe me as brave or courageous for talking about gout, and yet gout is really bloody painful, and I'm not deterred by the pain. Isn't this the dictionary definition of courageous? And it's not like people don't know it's painful. The, the standard reaction I get from I suffer from gout is, ouch, I bet that's painful. Uh, yes, it is. Sometimes it's so bad, I, I can't work, but I take medication for it, and it's mostly under control. Plus, it's nowhere near as bad as being headless. Tell someone you have depression, and a lot of the time, you just see them trying to eject from the conversation as fast as possible. Honestly, what I'd like is the response of, oh, I, I bet that sucks. Uh, yes, it does. Sometimes it's so bad I can't work. But I take medication for it, and, and it's mostly under control. So what's the difference here? Um, it turns out it's a whole host of things. Uh, let's look at the biggest first. What is depression? I hate the term depression. It's crap. People see it and they go, oh, you're depressed. Have you tried positive thinking? Um, I'm going to start calling death lazy heart syndrome. Oh, you've got a lazy heart. Have you started thinking rhythmic thoughts? No, they're dead. Then the off-the-cuff helpful advice really does my nut. I may look gormless, but I can tie my own shoelaces, and I can if I could fix my illness that easily, do you not think that I would have done it? Also, and I'm going to stress this in 1,000-point bold rainbow-colored text, I am not sad. At least, no more than the next person. Yes, I get sad. Life sucks. I know I've got 46 years experience, but life is also joyous. I know I've got 46 years experience. Depression is not sadness. Far from it. Sadness is just a feeling. Depression can be the utter lack of feeling. Just a big, black, empty hole where feeling should be. 
that snot-filled, gut-wrenching sobbing that many people no doubt felt when this fine gentleman died is grief, not depression. Grief can lead to depression, but the two are different things. I felt a deep sadness when I learned of Russell's passing. I hoped I would see him again at this conference, even if, if just virtually. But that's not because I suffer from depression. It's because I'm human. If I'd been in the throes of the depressive period, my response might not have been sadness. It might have actually been near indifference. Russell died? Well, that sucks. I should probably kill myself. When the black dog of depression comes, the world is empty, barren, void. Nothing brings joy, and for me at least, all I can hear is a little voice going, this is pointless, you need to die. Now, remember, sample size of one, other experiences of depression may vary, and here is a more cheerful, cheerful creature. And apparently, gouty is really painful, and my German was okay. So, the NHS described depression as, uh, depression as a low mood that lasts for weeks, or months and affects your daily life. Now, that's a, necessity, uh, a necessarily simplistic view that only really describes the, the depressive bouts. You can have many of these bouts over the course of your life. And the symptoms they list do include feelings of unhappiness, but that is not sadness. That is a lack of happiness. Sadness is not the opposite of happiness. And these feelings are not just things that you can snap out of, although I do reserve the right to snap at you if you tell me to pull myself together. This quote comes from Harvard Health. Uh, it's often said that depression results from chemical imbalance, but that figure of speech doesn't capture how complex the disease is. The word here, uh, or this word here, is, is, is the one I want to focus on, disease. Um, a disorder of structure or function in a human. Now, disease is, is an emotive word. It, it comes as a biblical plagues or the Black Death. I'd describe the current uh, pandemic as, as, as a virus, not, not a disease. So seeing the word used to describe depression is, is quite jarring for me. But only because we spend most of our lives dancing around the subject. I often wonder if my depression stems from what I... Uh, what appears to be my, my first suicide attempt. Um, it would certainly uh, explain a lot. Um, let me explain. In the womb, uh, the fetus is utterly dependent on the mother for everything. They are joined by the umbilical cord, which allows functions not possible to a fetus to occur. Things like getting oxygen. It is possible for a fetus during the course of pregnancy to tie the umbilical cord in a knot. This is normally not a problem in the womb, but during birth, the knot could be pulled tight. Until the newborn baby is able to breathe on its own, this can cause issues. It is also possible for the cord to become uh, entangled around the fetus, and if this entanglement is around the neck, then that can cause problems when the newborn baby tries to take its first breath. I did both. Um, I was a forceps birth and came out blue. Not, I'm going to hold my breath until I turn blue, blue. Blue like the colour of ink blue. Honestly, I thought I'd given birth to a freak. A direct quote from my mother on the miracle of the birth of her first child. So, did this oxygen starvation somehow lead to brain damage, which results in this mess you see before you? Uh, don't know. Sample size one, no control to compare against. What I do know is that my view of the world and myself appears, in part, to be at odds with what is considered normal, and that sometimes I go through bleak periods where life is just pointless. So my brain function is not normal for, for some arbitrary definition of normal. And this manifests itself in certain ways. And for the most part, I can function normally in society. There are times where I need to discard the fact that society can just sod off. Um, and there are rare days when I cannot function. I take those as sick days or at least I would if I didn't work for a progressive company. Um, and historically, I've, I've kept quiet about my condition because it's easier to pretend to be normal than to deal with the rampant misunderstandings surrounding mental health. And depression isn't the only mental health issue to suffer from this. Schizophrenia is the biggie. Schizophrenia is not the same as multiple or dis disassociative personality disorder. Um, according to Wikipedia, schizophrenia is a psychiatric disorder characterized by continuous or relapsing episodes of psychosis. OCD, that's another good example. 
The OED apparently describes or defines OCD as short for obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm unable to confirm this as I'm not willing to pay for a subscription just for a good bit of alliteration. Uh, Wikipedia uh, says obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, disorder OCD is a mental disorder in which a person has certain thoughts repeatedly called obsessions or feels the need to perform, perform certain routines called compulsions to an extent which generates distress or impairs general functioning. It goes on. The person is unable to control either the thoughts or the activities for more than short periods of time. Common compulsions include hand washing, counting of things, and checking to see if a door is locked. Now, when you're accusing someone of being a bit OCD about something, consider the final sentence in that definition. These activities occur to such a degree that the person's daily life is neg negatively affected, often taking more than an hour a day. There is a huge difference between me getting a bit twitchy about this and someone who has OCD. For all the crap that I may or may not suffer from, OCD is mercifully not one of them. I just like things straight and my colors in order. So uh, this is a photo of me at university. I was poor. I mean, not having to borrow tens of thousands of pounds for the education poor. I was lucky enough to have my education paid for by the government. I was more, I'd rather spend my money on having a good time than non-essential items like food. I was painfully underweight, to the point where people would spontaneously hand me food when they saw me. I look at this photo now and I think, wow, I was thin. At the time, I didn't notice. It was just me. Now, it's important to note that I did not have anorexia. I wasn't starving myself to lose weight. I wasn't worried about becoming fat. I just prioritized my means in other ways. But despite the fact that my body was so starved that my hair and fingernails stopped growing, I did not notice how thin I was. Something which has given me a fresh perspective on people who actually suffer from eating disorders, because what they see and what you see are two entirely different things. In fact, that period of life has led me to a different problem, which resulted in a, a very unhealthy relationship with food. Um, in those days, if there was food available, I would eat all of it. Um, when you don't know when your next meal is coming from, you eat until you might burst, and hopefully it'll find you over. This way of thinking about food still persists with me, but I am no longer poor. The phrase, you can't have your cake and eat it, makes no sense to me. I just buy two cakes. Actually, better make that three because I may decide that I want more after I've had the first cake. Um, like a child in the sweet shop, they have what, a tenner? I have a credit card with a limit of thousands. And what you see as a family pack, I see as an individually wrapped portion. Sadly, unlike when I was very underweight, I am painfully aware that I am overweight. My body quite literally disgusts me, although it's more than just its, its girth and lard distribution. And this makes me sad, and so I eat chocolate to cheer up, and you can spot the problem here. When people describe another person as, as a bit schizophrenic or ooh, they're a bit OCD, uh, they lack the proper context. A good analogy is saying, oh, I can't come into work today, I have the flu. No, you don't, you have a cold. It may be a bad cold and it may warrant you staying at home, but I'm pretty sure it's not the flu, because you were able to call me and tell me. The flu is lying in bed, wanting to die with Richard and Judy on the television and the remote scant millimeters from your hand, but you are unable to change the channel because you are so ill. Flu is curling up in the shower, crying, while your body does the metaphor metaphorical equivalent of everybody out. Use all available exits. I generally lampoon people calling cold the flu by referring to it as death or the plague. Sorry, I, I can't come into work today. I've got a bad case of death or as we're calling it now, lazy heart syndrome. What has happened is that, is that language, the, the, the mechanism by which we, we, we try and update our shared context has been corrupted to the point where the words literally no longer mean what they used to. And I mean literally in the original literal sense, not in the more modern figurative sense. So I say depression and you hear sad. Uh, and then the unhelpful suggestions start rolling in. Exercise releases endorphins. I know that, so does chocolate. Guess which one I picked? And I used to go to the gym regularly. I had a personal trainer. I was learning how to do Muay Thai. And then I moved to pure boxing because I signed up for a white-collar boxing match. And apparently it's not a good look to win by uh, elbowing your opponent in the face and then ramming a knee to their sternum. 
Which led me to an interesting question. Why is beating myself over the head labeled self-harm and yet paying someone else to do it is considered sport? Why is having the crap punched out of me uh, a brave thing to do to, and, and to be celebrated, but punching the crap out of myself is something we'd really rather just gloss over and, and, and not talk about? If you look at the scorecard for the night, um, I, I lost by unanimous decision. Um, if you watch the video, I, I, uh, I dropped my guard, got cracked in the windpipe, and then I was unable to breathe for, for the rest of the fight. Um, I, I lost there and then, basically. And the remaining seven and a half minutes were, were me just trying to mitigate uh, the onslaught. I got beaten from pillar to post. Uh, the ref had to step in at one point and give me a standing count because he didn't think I was able to continue. I disagreed. I waded back in there as soon as I could, and I got beaten up some more. And I came out of that ring having won because my context was very different to everyone else's. Yes, it would have been nice to win the fight, but that was somewhat secondary. This is about what I could actually do if I was in harm's way. If someone was actually trying to hurt me and I never backed down, I suspect this is a trait that has kept me alive. While the human body is, is really quite robust and, and, and good at self-repair, there are a number of vectors one can use to overwhelm this ability, most of which are, are painful and, and not guaranteed to work if you are attempting to self-contract lazy heart syndrome. Um, I know in my darker uh, moments, uh, I, I surf the web and I research this, um, so I know a lot about it. That said, taking your own life is actually pretty easy if you know what you're doing. A few simple orders from Amazon, and you've got yourself a fairly robust, pain-free method of ending it all. Uh, if that's actually the outcome you're after. Now, I, I detest this phrase, cry to help. It's like some kind of euphemism, uh, which means people go, oh, yeah, they had a cry for help, and we helped, and help was provided, and it all went away. Uh, and I'm glad you feel better, because P.S., it never went away. We just got better at hiding it. It's not a cry for help. It's a search for a way out. For a lot of us, it's an escape route, a safety valve. Um, if things get too bad, then I can bug out. It can almost be a game of brinkmanship. Let's see if the imperative to survive can stop the maelstrom that, that, that's going on in my head. But sadly, sometimes it's because it's just no longer bearable to go on. Suicide is, is, is not the coward's way out. It takes determination. If it didn't, I suspect there would be far, far fewer humans out there. Now... I mentioned university. However, the fact is, I, I don't have a degree. The first six weeks of my course, I was the model student. I read ahead. I did more than was required for assignments. Notes were organized, filed, color-coded. I turned up to lectures and I paid attention. I asked questions and then I discovered beer, women, and uh, drugs. Actually, that's not entirely true. I discovered beer and women prior to university. It took me six weeks to discover whether like-minded people were going for beer. The, the, the rest kind of followed uh, naturally. Uh, I became nocturnal. I, I was clubbing three nights a week. I didn't go to lectures. I, I didn't do my coursework. And then uh, the end of year exams, uh, I failed spectacularly. Actually, again, not true. Many of them I failed quite pathetically because I just actually didn't turn up. Uh, after all, the dance floor is not going to hit itself. And it's not my fault that the university decided to host many of the exams after a late night bender. Mercifully, I am poorly put together and my kidneys are somewhat bizarre in quantity and organization. Uh, they're also really quite prone to things like pyelonephritis, uh, a lovely kidney infection that can and has hospitalized me. Uh, that struck mid-exam season and provided me with a uh, oven ready excuse as to why I dropped out of the first year. Fast forward a, a few more years, uh, more years than I care to mention, in fact, and I'm clubbing a lot less often than I was then, and I'm fast approaching the stage where I have given more lectures on programming at universities than I ever attended. And the irony is not lost on me. One of my favorite lectures is where I just rock up and do my job, partly because it requires very little prep and partly because it introduces students to the realities of programming in the real world. I'll pick a small task that doesn't contain anything sensitive and I'll basically code it live, ideally getting all the way to deployment. And this isn't some pre rehearsed slick presentation. This is new code, freshly squeezed on the day, resplendent with WTFs, Googles, compilation errors that make no sense, subtle bugs that turn out to be because I'm an idiot, and all the other accoutrements of day-to-day -day developer life. Now, 
Ideally, the students will learn a thing or two about programming during that lecture, but that's not the point. The point is that I, after I don't know how many years I've been a programmer, get it wrong all the time. You don't leave university suddenly knowing all there is to know about programming. You don't suddenly have superhuman powers or access to arcane secrets, which is something I used to fret about a lot. I mean, what if all these university graduates know the secret algorithms and I'm just being a dumb kid doing dumb things because I don't know better? Turns out there were no secret algorithms, although I was being a dumb kid doing dumb things because that's how we all start, unless you're starting later in life when you're a dumb adult doing dumb things. Now, i am become a slightly smarter adult doing dumb things, and I find the most useful lesson I can give to students is the fact that not having a blind clue what you are doing is the normal state of affairs for most people. On most subjects, it turns out. I do a lot of mentoring, and a question I get asked a lot is, is how do I adult? Now, to which my honest answer is, I don't know. As soon as I work it out, I will let you know which is why I'm here telling you random crap about my brain, which doesn't really seem to relate to programming in any way, shape, or form. Much as my narcissism would have me believe that I am special and uniquely different from everyone else, the reality is likely to be a lot more mundane. There's a figure banded around that about one in four people will experience some form of mental health problem. A quick Google actually gives the stat that one in four people will experience mental health problems of some kind each year in England. And more worryingly, one in six people report experiencing common mental health problems like anxiety and depression in any given week in England. So look to your left, look to your right, and you'll notice you're not sat in an auditorium and you may actually well be alone. The current situation in the UK and the rest of the world means that figure may well be higher. The news is talking about a mental health crisis in both adults and worryingly children. This talk was proposed in the before uh, for ACCU 2020. A year on, and, and arguably it's, it's more relevant than it ever was. Some of you may know Dr. Gail Ollis, who, who joked that she's going to need this T-shirt once lockdown is over. The pandemic has, has disrupted our normal social fabric, and, and many of us are, are suffering quite badly. Very quick aside, uh, you may not be able to see. I'm um, trying to sort of up a bit. Whoa. Um, Gail made me this t-shirt uh, because I banged on about there being no t-shirts this year. Um, the back is a complete list of, of, of speakers for this talk. Um, teaching commitments means that uh, she is not able to watch live, but Gail, for when you watch this later, thank you so much. Um, I love it. Um, oh, uh, other things I'm loving. Lockdown, because it forces all my interactions to be online. I I'm more social now than I ever was because I can socialise on my terms. But even I miss the in-person part of ACCU Conf. The drinks in the bar, the, the conversations, just the general human interaction with the people that I may not see until the next conference. Mental health issues can affect all of us for many, many different reasons. Now, the usual takeaway here is that, uh, would be that I am not alone. Although I just hear I'm not special. We'll, we'll come to that in a bit. Um, more importantly though, you are not alone. And you'd be surprised uh, at the people out there who have mental health issues with no outward sign that there is a problem. In, in that respect, it's a little bit like asthma. You can have someone for ages and not know, and then one day, pff, out comes the inhaler, and you go, oh, they're asthmatic. Well, actually, that's where the similarity ends, because asthma is just one of those things. It sucks for the people who have it, especially if it's bad, but if other finds out, it's just other people find out, it's just a, a minor bit of trivia. Uh, something about someone that's basically inconsequential. Mental health problems, on the other hand. Hmm. Now, this is where the sample size of one becomes uh, a little problematic. I may be wrong, uh, but the situation in the US sounds like everyone is seeing a shrink and they're all scoffing down handfuls of SSRIs. Mental health issues are not remarkable and they're a bit like an asthma inhaler. Doesn't quite feel like that in the UK. Announcing to the world that I have a mental health problem had me asking some quite far-reaching questions. Would this impact my ability to get a job? Will it hamper investment in our startup? Basically, will I be discriminated against? We're back to being brave and, and courageous again. And yes, I know, middle-aged white guy having to deal with discrimination to cry me a river. But let's consider someone transgender. They announced to the world that they also have mental health problems. And I bet you some people react along the lines of, oh, well, that explains everything. Can you imagine 
how demeaning that is. While I have actually been diagnosed with clinical depression, the reality is I probably have borderline personality disorder. I don't have a formal clinical diagnosis because there's no point. The local NHS has been in remedial measures for mental health for over a decade, and the pills I pop every day seem to deal with most of it. Borderline personality disorder is uh, a mental illness characterized by a long-term pattern of unstable relationships. Mm, this is on the internet, so I'm just going to gloss over that one and say, yep, tick done. Um, distorted sense of self. Ooh, yes. Uh, I mean, that is a rabbit hole we could disappear down and, and, and never actually uh, come back from. So let's just uh, let, let's pop this slide on hold and uh, pop this up. Um, this, this is me. I mean, it was me. I'm younger, I'm, I'm thinner, I'm uh, a little bit photoshopped. Uh, but this is how I see myself in my head. Even this image, which is my usual public-facing image, is getting to be a decade old. And the face that we can all see on the camera is someone I don't really recognize. How I look in my head when doing certain things and how I actually look are often polar opposites. I thought I was doing okay when I was doing my boxing training, and then I watched the videos, and all I could see was this ponderous fat bloke flailing about with his fists and getting punched in the face a lot. And this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to me and what's going on in, in here versus reality for a given definition of reality. Anyway, back to our definition. Unstable relationships, distorted sense of self, and strong emotional reactions. We can plot this. Uh, here is a, a fairly typical person. Sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. Sometimes something just takes the wind right out of their cells and causes more of a step change. So I get the impression that for many uh, sufferers of depression, it's sort of periods like this. The lows are lower and the highs can be just something of a, of a flat line. Meh. You can still have that step change. And this is me. Uh, by the way, the mood scale is logarithmic. This is what the pills do, which in a way sucks because those highs are really good. But the lows, they're bad. Really, really bad. So unstable relationships, distorted sense of self, uh, strong emotional reactions. Those affected often engage in self-harm and other dangerous behavior. Yep, those lows will do that to you. ACCU is, is it all about inclusivity. We all proudly display our pronouns. I am he, him. So I think it's safe to conclude that I am not a 16-year-old girl. And yet there are many who think that self-harm is, is the preserve of teenage girls who are basically attention-seeking. I, I don't want attention when I'm self-harming. I, I want the pain in my head to go away. So I cause pain to my body to distract myself. Or I stuff myself full of crap in a weird mashup of feeding a sugar addiction and punishing myself for being overweight by eating things that will make me overweight. Anyone of any gender and any age can self-harm in, in a myriad of ways. The cliched trope of the teenage girl with cuts up her arm is just, just one of many, many things that fall into that category. It's even possible to self-harm in public without anyone noticing. Practice makes perfect or, or something like that. Uh, they may also struggle with feelings of emptiness. Depression, yep, emptiness in spades, check. Uh, fear of abandonment, <laughs> nope, nope. If you don't make any meaningful connections, then you can't get abandoned. Either that or I'm just an egotistical prick. Either are, are valid. And detachment from uh, reality. Uh, again, define reality. Um, so sample size of one, I have uh, absolutely no proof any of you exist in the same way I exist. Not only that, but it's actually unprovable. The universe could be something that sprang from nothing and evolved into what we see now, where I'm just one of many billions of humans and nothing special. Or the entire universe could have been created entirely for me, populated with simulacra who are there for me to interact with. For me, there would be no observable difference. Although for scenario two, see, yeah, please see distorted sense of self. And ultimately, it doesn't matter. Either the simulation stops running, or the universal's back on itself in, in, in the big crunch, or we end up in this maximally entropic state in which we have the infinite distribution of little tiny particles homogeneously spaced around, uh, spread around a, a spaceless universe. At long term, nothing 
I do makes even the slightest bit of difference, the end will always be the same. Entropy will find a way. Onwards, uh, symptoms of uh, BPD uh, may be triggered by events considered normal to others. There's that normal word again. I'm not sure I like that word, uh, partly because I want to be special, uh, see so distorted sense of self, but also what is normal? Uh, let's take something as simple as the human face. I guess normal is two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Incidentally, this is an electrical outlet. Uh, our brains are programmed to see faces. The size, location, and, and color of facial features is not fixed. They follow distributions. This outlet had a starring role in the screen movie franchise. Um, so what if I only have one eye? Am I now abnormal? Sounds like quite a harsh judgment, given I'm still human. And what about normal function? I, like many people, wear glasses. My eyes do not perform as well as they should. Is this abnormal? Given how eyesight deteriorates with age, are older people without corrective lenses abnormal? Or are we just different? BPD typically begins by early adulthood, seems to check out, uh, and occurs across a variety of situations. Some size one, I can't comment. Substance abuse, for me, that's sugar and caffeine, although that may just be due to me being a developer, don't know. Uh, however, it used to be alcohol, nicotine, uh, and other things. Uh, depression, yep, I already mentioned that. And eating disorders are commonly associated with BPD. Yep, I think we covered that as well. Um, approximately 10% 10 of people affected with the disorder die by suicide. Yeah, that's one in 10. Um, still, if we compare the, that against the background suicide rate of the UK, which in, in 2016 was 8.9 um, um, deaths per 100,000 population, right? that, that's just 0.089%. Are my chances three orders of magnitude worse? Bugger. Fun fact, I, I fully did not expect to see the year 2000. Um, living until the age of 25 seemed a near impossible feat of endurance that was bound to fail due to the uh, intervention on my part, because life is generally impossibly hard, uh, sort of. Uh, I'm 46, uh, and if we were in the US with a live studio audience, we'd now be having spontaneous applause at what Bill Bailey would describe as a meaningless milestone of decay. 50 seems much more achievable than 25 ever did. But as I learned from the boxing, I don't seem to know when to quit. I just plow on. I don't know if this is just self-preservation, blind stupidity, or an ego that is not ready to let there be a dom-free universe. And ultimately, I don't want to die at all, ever. Entropy to be damned. Admittedly, sometimes I don't want to be part of this reality, which is why I love computer games and VR, but the fundamental essence that is me, that I want to go on for as long as possible. Ideally, dumping the fleshy me bag that is my life support system because the me bag wasn't well put together and it's, 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 it's showing signs of wear and tear and, and I can't seem to upgrade to a newer model. Okay, final sentence. The disorder is often stigmatized in both the media and the psychiatric field. Great, so the people who are meant to be treating me may stigmatize me. How is that going to help? Clicking through into the cited sources, because despite the seemingly random nature of this rambling talk, I did actually do some research, we see this. The result is a self-fulfilling prophecy and a cycle of stigmatization to which both patient and therapist contribute. So the disorder is stigmatized, and in part, it's, it's my fault. Which is why I stole handfuls of pills for breakfast, and I have very little desire to go out and seek further help or diagnosis. Ultimately, whatever mental health problems I have, I am still high-functioning with a successful career, and a life that I would broadly consider to be good, despite its lack of save and reload options. So what the hell does this have to do with programming or a tech conference? Everything. Oh, wait, we started here. Um, I've, I've done previous talks at ACCU about how people are the key component of, of all software. And we've had keynotes and past conferences on emotional code, humaning, and, and building community. As Kevin said yesterday, programming is applied philosophy. Code is nothing without people. And as we've already seen, people are buggy and error prone at the best of times. 
code doesn't exist in isolation. It's written to fulfill a requirement, and that requirement is, is a context which is passed down the chain from, from the person who has the requirement to the person implementing uh, the requirement, and that completely ignores the context that need to go the other way and the external context that need to be considered. Even ignoring mental health issues, this program, uh, this process has errors baked right into it. Forget about error correction. This is error introduction. Ah, but Dom, I hear you say, I write software for myself. I have all the context that I need, to which I reply, I am internally inconsistent, and I don't think that's anything to do with BPD. I'm, I'm willing to place money on the fact that you are too. Uh, we could easily be both human A and human B, and these state changes are still valid. The moment you introduce humans into the loop, things become fungible. Actually, that's not entirely true. That depends on there being true randomness in the universe. If there is no randomness and the universe is deterministic, and given the pre precise starting conditions, you could theoretically determine the exact effect of introducing humans into the loop, but only if the starting state dictated that such a thing should happen. Not being an external observer can really suck at times. Anyway, my point is that we're not yet at a stage where humans are out of the loop, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure we want to be in that position, so we need to deal with it. Humans are, are hideously complicated. Um, and while I don't wish to stereotype, there is a strong indication that many in our industry are not best equipped to deal with that complexity. The reality is what you say affects people. What you do affects people. Let's take the example. Oh, it's, it's, it's really simple. You just. Um, how do I make toad in the hole without the batter just going flat on me? Oh, it's really simple. You just make sure the oil is smoking hot, put the dish on the hob to high heat and keep the oil hot. Uh, and you probably don't want to be using that crappy metal dish you've got. Try a ceramic one. Did I end up with a, a lovely fluffy toad in the hole as depicted in this delightful stock photograph? Uh, no, uh, I ended up uh, in a living nightmare uh, with smoking hot oil covering the hob and, and having to evacuate a three-year-old child from the kitchen before dealing with the whole very hot, very flammable uh, mess. Let me explain. There was some missing context. Apparently, the uh, high heat hob trick is for a gas hob, uh, not a, a halogen hob. And you want, might want to make sure that you've got a, a high quality ceramic dish that you can survive thermal shock, not some creep free, uh, cheap freebie from Domio. So we, we take our, our cheap dish from the oven with its smoking hot oil and we place it on top of a red hot flat surface on the hob. And then we apply room temperature batter. Physics does its thing and the dish shatters, emitting smoking hot oil all over the red hot surface of the hob. Now, I have no idea how close the smoke point of the oil was to the, 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 the flash point, but I'm pretty sure the direct contact with the red hot halogen hob would not end well. So step one, kill the heat. Uh, there is nothing that can be done to contain the oil. So step two was to lob a tea towel in the washing up bowl in case it's needed later and scoop up the three-year-old child, depositing her quickly uh, in another room. Step four was going to be throwing the wet tea towel over the whole ensemble and then try one. I, I, I don't know what really. Um, anyway, luck was, was on my side uh, and the batter had started to cook, making what was a kind of a coffer dam around a lot of the oil which meant that I could roll up the tea towel and, and surround the rest of it and let the thing cool and then clean up the mess uh, at a later date. So it may be simple with the correct context, correct tools, uh, and the correct knowledge. And without those, it could be a disaster waiting to happen. Telling someone who has spent the past two hours Googling to find a solution, oh, that's really simple, can make them feel like an idiot. My go-to here is to simply smile and go, oh, yeah, that. this is what you need to do. Explain, and then explain the only reason why I know is because I also spent two hours Googling the internet for the same thing last week. So takeaway number two, because I'm aware you're supposed to have uh, these takeaways and, and leave these things with something concrete. Uh, words have power. Choose them wisely. It is not a coincidence that humility and human share the same root. As Michelle McNamara said, life is chaos. Be kind. It's really all we have to fight the chaos. Now, I, I work with someone who is described as having robust mental health. Uh, they openly admit they have no basis of understanding for others uh, with mental health problems. 
they also implement what is, uh, in my opinion, the best mental health policies uh, possible at the business. They have a therapist on retainer, and employees can contact them directly, uh, no questions asked. It doesn't need authorization. It doesn't need that embarrassing chat uh, asking about it. It's there for you to use, should you need it. Their reasoning? Well, they wouldn't expect you to come to them if you had a broken leg. You'd go see a medical professional. Sadly, mental health provision in this country, and in our region especially, is sorely lacking. So he's covered it with the company as effectively part of the medical health perks. And this is entirely the correct approach. They ignore the mental part of it. It's a health problem. And like all health problems, you go see a doctor or a specialist and you get treatment. And just like all health problems, some of them are things you do not want to talk about. From experience, some health problems are things that others don't want you to talk about. Men especially seem to get quite distressed when I explain how a number of the kidney stones that I've had over the years were removed. Uh, hint, urinary tract. Uh, so no, they don't go in via your bum. Amusingly, it doesn't seem to make any more comfort for them if I say that some of these stones just got passed, especially when I tell them the sizes of these stones. But... What if we want to talk about our mental health problems? Tough, taboo subject. Let's talk about something less emotive. Is vegan, is honey vegan? Why is, why is talking about mental health so taboo? Well, for men, I can say in a large part because it involves feelings and, and men, manly men with, with a capital M, do not have uh, feelings. I suspect there's a large overlap with, with this group and the set of people who describe women as being emotional or hormonal. And broadly speaking, they're right. Hormones and emotions may well be involved, but they're involved for, for, for everyone. Uh, even the most manly of manly men have hormones, uh, not just testosterone. Uh, and the same holds true for emotions. We, we all have them. True story. Couple that with a pretty stiff upper lip, and you've got... Someone who will answer the question, are you all right with, yeah, yeah, I am, good, thanks, right before throwing themselves in front of the train. Do not be surprised if I answer the phrase, hey, how are you, with shit. You asked, I answered. Likely not your fault that it's all shit, but the interaction can continue with that bit of context in play. And honestly, interactions with most of my friends will result in shit turning into feeling better things. Not because Dom is in a shit mood and let's pander to him, just because we may quickly articulate what is so bad and then just carry on as if it weren't bad. And again, this really doesn't have to be about mental health. Hey, Dom, how are things? Shit, I just dropped my favorite handmade plate and now my dinner is all over the floor. The correct response might be something like, you idiot, so what was for dinner? That's likely how most of my friends would respond. Oops, too far. Now, there was more. Uh, there was uh, a, a lot more. Uh, but time, both in terms of, of the length of, of the session and the, the fact that I finished writing this at 5 a.m. this morning, means I need to, to, to stop and... and it, the time we have left, we can answer any questions that, that, that may be raised. To paraphrase Kevin, this talk was not about giving you the answer. It is giving you the shape of the space. A shape that is likely more complex than you first think because of the issues of, of shared contexts. A shape that, when viewed from a different angle, shows a lot of hidden contexts. All running on something much much more complex and arguably completely broken, the human brain. Now, I hope you found this useful. I, I know I did, although conference talks as a substitute for therapy sessions is a fairly drastic move. Um, but at least the stunned silence that I normally get following one of my talks is a function of you all being muted and not you all being shocked. Right, I'm going to leave this slide up here while we spend the rest of the session talking, or in your case, typing. Um, if anyone has anything they want to talk about, if they want to uh, go through this, or if we're all like, no, I don't want to talk about this, um, I will be in the, um, uh, the lobby outside after the talk. So we're getting some thanks. Um, people, people clearly enjoyed it. A uh, lot of food for thought, yes. Um, just make sure that food is properly prepared and doesn't end up spread across the kitchen. Um, 
you are all very, very welcome. Uh, people there saying that it's a very, very caring and honest answer. Um, it's it's something that I've had to build up. Um, the, 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 the sort of honesty, because we can all sit there and go, yeah, I'm fine. Um, we're, we're clearly, clearly not. I mean, I've done the whole, <laughs> I'm fine. Um, you know, you're not fine. Um, it's okay not to be okay. Um, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, that I, I'm trying to sort of tell everyone that, that it's fine to not be okay. Um, you're not brave. You're not courageous. You're just, you're just human. Um, this is much needed, thanks. Um, it was very needed. This has been really cathartic for me. Um, it, it's been really interesting doing a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the research. Um, I have also managed to diagnose myself with a bunch of other disorders, including lupus, um, in the course of, of, of doing this. And as House said, um, it's never lupus. Uh, Jim has asked, to what extent are you happy for your talk to be shared or would you prefer it to float in the ACCU backwater only? I am perfectly happy for this talk to go out on the internet. I have edited it to be public friendly. Um, so I've taken out some of the bits that I don't want uh, shared. Um, so I worked on the premises, it's going to be filmed, it's going to be filmed, it's going to go out there. Um, and also I suspect that a lot of the audience are what I would call the choir. You understand and, and sympathise with, with these kind of situations and perhaps this may need to be watched by other people who get it recommended to them um, to help them sort of see um, different perspectives or that there are other people suffering the, the, the same way um, that, that they are. So this is very much material that can go out there and, and, and be um, and be shared. And I will be putting the talk on the um, on, on the chat. I need to reduce the slide count slightly. There were 333 slides. Um, John Lake, I'll see your heart out. Um, <laughs> I'm fine and just not very fine at the moment. It's something I've used in the past. That's a very good response, um, especially now. I mean, I, I have um, chat groups with um, gents I've known for, for a long time and it, it, it's the worst locker room talk you can think of we go there to be bullied effectively by each other and one of the one of the biggest bullies in inverted commas the other day turned around and just went I'm I'm not fine I'm not okay and in that forum where any sign of weakness is kind of attacked as, as kind of you know, love uh, to, to, to have people coming out just because of the general situation that we, we, we find ourselves in now was, was really quite telling um, Tom said, as someone who's supporting people with depression, I found this very useful. It's it's very, very hard sometimes to support people who, who, who suffer from depression because they often don't want to actually tell you what they're feeling um, for fear of judgment. Um, they often think that perhaps their feelings are not worthy of, of, of merit. Um, they may also, I mean, just occasionally I want a hug. And you know, turning around to someone and saying, can I, can I have a hug, please? For me, as a very stiff British person who will give that hug in a mm, type way, um, it, it's nearly uh, impossible, uh, which is why I'll be making a beeline for Gail when, uh, when we are allowed out again, because I won't have a, ch a chance. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very hard. There's a lot of very good, um, easy to digest resources out there. I'd recommend reading, uh, there's a, a webcomic by um, Robot Hugs, um, and one of one of the uh, one of the best ones is um, just sort of explaining this. You know, are you okay? No, I, I'm not okay. Is there anything I can do? Not really. And then they just make a nest for that person and crawl in the nest, and they just sit there. And that it's it's sometimes just being there and, and, and sort of just saying nothing is is the way forward. But it's it's really hard, and I, I do feel for you if if, uh, if you're having to support someone. Um, one of the things I found in the, 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 the talk I did in Nordev that wasn't filmed, the amount of people, surprising people who came up and just indicated that, yeah, this was, this was them or had been them in the past. Um, and uh, that, that really surprised me. Um, indeed, self-harm suicide attempts are often hidden even from your spouse. Yes, they are. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. I mean, you can find it if you, if you, Google um, enough, but it's, it's not something I, I, I sort of endorse. But my my wife in her business um, had in the house everything I needed to um, very easily off oneself, and you 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 can't sort of say that <laughs> the stuff you use for work you might not want to leave me around it when I'm I'm not feeling great. 
um, it's 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 not something that you can tell someone. It's it's so you just you keep it to yourself, and then you go on the internet and. In the middle of the night is the worst thing. You go on the internet, you start looking for resources to help, and they're also bloody twee. I, I, I hate that. I'm I'm not I'm not looking for these sort of twee type responses. I'm I'm looking for your know, concrete facts. In my case, um, would, would be much much better. But everyone's different. We want different different support mechanisms and, and different things to help us um, cope. Um, does anyone else have a questions or statements or comments because otherwise I can I can let us out of school early um like I say I will be in um, Remo um if people want to actually come and have a face-to-face -face, uh, discussion with with uh, voice and everything um, and that won't be recorded so we can be uh, a, a little bit more uh, open um <laughs> someone saying that um it, it, it took them a, a, a a long time to people that uh, people don't want an honest answer to the question. Right? I view it very much like a, a network handshake. It, it, it's almost like an act knack. Um, I'm engaging. I'm starting this conversation. I acknowledge that you're starting this conversation. Um, do I know where in Remo you will be? Yes, I will be at one of those. Actually, let's let's go and move myself to one of those seats now. Um, ding ding. Um, apologies. Um, let's go find a, a floor that's got some space on it. They all look like they're quite good. Um, let's see if we can get a, a, an, oh, no there. Let's see if we can get a, an empty, empty table to sit at. Uh, table one on floor two is where I will be. Uh, I've plumped myself there. Um, so, uh, yeah, if that is uh, everything, um, I will let you out of school early. Thank you so much for, for, for coming and watching. It was, it was great to have um, a, a, a good audience out there. Um, I really um, hope this helped. And I will see you on the email if you want to chat. Um, goodbye.